So, have you, did anyone here read this book? So this is actually a fake book, Future of Serverless. There's no such book. But this one is actually a real book. Did you read it by any chance? It was published 20 years ago. And this book, although it's called Delphi Tree, this is the book where I've learned how to do microservices from. Keep in mind that was written in 98, 20 years ago and I've learned microservices from that book. And the reason why I'm telling you about this book is because the author said something very interesting. He said, you know, people say that predicting the future, you can't do that. No one can predict the future. And while well, they're actually wrong, because when you look about technology, and look about technology trends, it makes, it's very easy to predict what's going to be the next phase and the next steps. It's only a question of looking far back enough and understand what's going on. And at the time, he was talking about moving from one computer mainframe to desktop and client server in three-tier applications, which was just starting at the time, and said, so what's going to be the next step after the three-tier? That's going to be the end tier and the microservices. He actually described microservice architecture and he actually described a lot of the challenges in building something like that already. So I'm going to take a similar approach. I'm Yoav Abrami, I'm, build, I'm the head of Wix code at Wix.com, which is a developer platform, a serverless developer platform, built on Wix. And I'm going to show you what we've learned as we went through a, a similar process in our business. And so I'm going to talk about serverless. I'm going to talk about uh, things that we learned as we've built a serverless platform. Some, some of the technology uh, challenges involved doing something like that, disruption, and so on. This is a slide I've created in 2013, which is showing the cloud space. Now, at the time, people used to call to talk about clouds in terms of infrastructure, which is about instances platforms, and SaaS products. SaaS products are like Salesforce and Wix, products that are provided, say, 100% online. Platforms are about a, you know, I just drop in my code and it runs, kind of. And infrastructure, we know that. Instances, now it's container as well. And the interesting thing about this slide is that we look at the middle, the platform stuff, it's actually divided into two. And there is the pass for backend, which is a Roku app engine, and so on. By the way, app engine, if you don't know, app engine was the first serverless product. And that was in 2008. That's the first serverless that we've ever seen ever. And there were also the pass for front end, Firebase and Parse.com, which Today, Firebase is, was acquired by Google, and Pulse was acquired by Facebook, and then shut down a few years later. And what we realized at the time is actually that Pass for front-end is not for front-end. It's for mobile. And there is a gap. There was a problem or a market failure. There was no platform to build websites or web apps. And that is the target that we set out to build when we went to, talk, to build Wix code. That was 2013. We launched the product about a year ago. So it took us some time to build the product. And as far as I know, we're still the only player in that field. So what is serverless? Do you have a definition for what is serverless? You can think about a good definition for it. So I'm going to tell you something very simple about that. So let's look about some examples. Amazon Lambda. Who uses Amazon Lambda? Nice. So, you know, it can be triggered by events. You can actually have the API gateway on top of it. And all of those stuff here are proprietary APIs from Amazon. And then you have Google Functions, which is pretty much the same product. And again, can be 
started from different events, and we have, again, Google-specific APIs, which are different from Amazon. And we have Azure Functions, which is the Azure serverless. And again, can be triggered from data processing and hooks and stuff like that. And again, they have their own flavor, which is a different API from Google and Amazon. And we have actually other stuff, like Twilio Functions. Whoever heard about Twilio, Twilio Functions? Have you used them? Yes. Nope, not yet. It's actually it's a very, very cool product, because you can actually react to incoming voice calls and incoming messages and create a function to do something about that. And again, they have their own specific API, which is different from the all other APIs. And we have, of course, our own Wix code modules, which uh, basically allows us to write serverless functions and just consume them from client code as if you're just doing a, a regular async call. We're wrapping all of the Ajax stuff underneath. And we can actually create HTTP functions and just call them out from console. And pretty much similar to all of the other providers. Again, it's our own API. So Wix code right now, it's Wix site. So a web modules, it just, it's a backend of Wix site that the front end can call. HTTP functions, you can call from anywhere in the world to the backend of a Wix site. And you can write this code. So this, you know, this is, for instance, a calculate load function that does some work with latency. So we're trying to find some definition. Martin Fowler tried to give some, he actually quoted other people from ThoughtWorks, which are both market leaders. And they were saying that it's serverless is server-side logic written by the application developer, runs in a serverless compute container, event-triggered, and fully managed by someone else. It's a nice definition. They're selling us a magic pitch. You don't manage your servers. There's magic scaling. It just works. You only pay for what you use. And you can just throw your code over there and it will work. You know, you, you, did you hear about DevOps? So the thing about, the thing about DevOps in the, all, all of their introduction, they're saying what DevOps is about. The old model of building software was that developers would build their code and then just throw it over the wall and system guys would manage that code. And that didn't work, of course. Serverless is the anti-DevOps holy grail. You just throw your code and someone else will make it work. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a question. The thing is that it is a trade. And it's a trade that you need to know what you're trading. You're trading your freedom. You are very restricted in terms of what you can choose. You're very restricted in your ability to react to all kinds of business instances. Just to give an example, if you want to have a Lambda or Google function or Azure function or whatever, that would answer in split second, in less than one millisecond, you won't get that. Even if it's warm and up and we're running all the time, it's, you know, we're paying 24 seven for it to be alive, you still won't get down below 80 milliseconds latency. And if you're not paying for that, you're going to pay a lot more than that. It's going to be, take a lot more time. So you're losing a lot of control. And what does it mean? You can't select your web framework. You can't do HTTP streaming. You can't do TCP IP, inbound, not outbound. You can't open a TCP endpoint someone connects to, which is built on serverless. Web sockets. You can't select your programming language. You're restricted with, with whatever is running on that cloud provider. So you're trading a lot of freedom. What do you gain? Fully managed, magically working service. So with that in mind, so let's ask what's going to happen with serverless. And there's some stuff which is very, very simple to say. Some predictions are trivial even, like, you know what, before I go to predictions, that, you know, the first thing that we said, that I said in the book from 20 years ago, it's let's look at uh, the past. Let's see what is the trend, right? So let's see the trend. Here I have a graph, and uh, that graph shows uh, how managed is the solution and the timeline. And also I have in those uh, 
red and the blue bars, the ease of use versus freedom. So PHP was actually a first instance where I would just throw my code, I would upload it using a FTP to a server, and it would work. I had a certain level of freedom. I, uh, it was very easy to use. Well, if you consider PHP, easy to use. And it was so successful that today we still have significant numbers of the internet built on PHP. It was that successful. Talk about significant numbers. It's, we know that it is over 25% of the internet is built on a PHP, probably more than that. So it was though such a successful PHP. In 2000, basically in 99, JTE was released. Do you know why I'm talking about J2E? Because if you read the specs and try to understand what they intended in building, it's serverless. They were talking about a managed application and all of their ideas are valid. The implementation was way off. It was way too early and that's why we don't really think that it's a really cool to build stuff on J2E today. By the way, who thinks J2E is better than PHP? Who thinks PHP is better? You have no idea. Given the choice, you will do something different, I guess. Okay, let's continue. We had EC2 coming up in 2006. And it's still, EC2 was basically you got instances from Amazon. You had only the basic operating system. You need to do everything yourself. It's nice, you know, because you had a hosted solution with PHP on a web hosting company. Now you have your own instance. You have more control. But it's out to use. You need to create the image, you need to install all the operating system, patches, all the software, everything there. Very successful product, it's what we call today the cloud, or the basic of the cloud. 2008, we have App Engine. App Engine actually have restricted the freedom quite a bit. You could only use Python and Java at the time in a very subset, very limited subset of those languages. But it just worked. You didn't care about anything. But at the time, it was perceived as too restrictive. And then we had things like Parse arriving in 2012, which says, you know, you're going to use just JavaScript. You create your JavaScript backend function. You have a database. It's very easy to use. It was geared toward mobile and was very successful. 2014, we have Amazon Lambda, which is basically the same product as Parse. Only that Amazon did a better execution. And we have containers and managed containers. Managed containers give you some mix in the middle because you don't care about the operating system. If you're going to manage containers on Amazon or on Google, you just install your container. You just build a container and just drop it there. You don't care about the operating system. But your freedom, you know, your freedom is a little bit restricted. If you don't have a certain package installed on the machine, you have a problem. But it's still easier to use, very good packaging, much easier than compared uh, to instances. And if we, with Wix code, what we've done, we've taken that approach to an extreme. We've actually, we're restricting you even more. We're much more opinionated and given much more magical product. So is that a good thing? It's your question. It's your, your, you should answer that. So let's talk about some predictions. More freedom. You have to remember I just said a few minutes ago, serverless took away your freedom. So we are going to see serverless solutions that can do H full support of HTTP and all of the other protocols involved like uh, web sockets and streaming and chunked and TCP and UDP. Memo is as a service if you're talking about a function and a function that might be a side effect free, you can just remember its result and you don't need to rerun it again and again. It can be as a service provided from the cloud provider. And we go, we'll do see stuff like serverless that can run something like Rust or Go or C. You know, why not? It should happen. But that's easy. That's very easy prediction. We'll see consolidation. Again, that's very easy to say. Because obviously, if the cloud providers have very similar offerings and we want to be portable between cloud providers, 
we would like to create a library that abstracts over different cloud providers. Well, guess what? There is one such library. There's actually a few of those. And what's going to happen is with all standards, all of the vendors will tap into a standard. It's going to be the standard for serverless. And all the players are going to be part of the standard. And all of the players are going to break the standard and add their own specific feature that only they have, which is non-standard, which is their added value in that product, in that space. We've seen that. You know, it happened so many times. Let's talk about containers for a second. So containers are a very cool product, very, very important. They had give us a lot of advantages. And here we're going to say something very hard. Containers, and specifically Kubernetes, is going to have a very hard choice. Either they're going to support serverless on Kubernetes if it's a first-class citizen, or they're going to die, die out. Kubernetes, right now, that still doesn't support serverless as a first-class citizen, is a very successful product that's going to die out. Why it's going, why it's going to happen? Because either it will support serverless or another product with another funky name will come up and take the market from them. Just like Kubernetes did to other products before it and just like containers did to instances and so on. Now this is, I know that sounds a bit extreme. I'm allowed to do that. I'm talking about the future. I'm allowed to be wrong. So let's talk about containers versus serverless for a second. Both of them are tools that are basically, containers and Kubernetes are, is the system tool that's built by developers. And you, you build Docker image and you just, you just manage the instances, someone else is managing the instances for you. Serverless is a developer facing product. You know, trivial packaging and you don't care about the instances at all. So it is a higher level of abstraction. And one of the things that we've seen is that higher level of abstractions tend to win out. So we are going to see a serverless orchestration product. It's going to be something that you can either install on any cloud or install in your in-house, or uh, you're going to use, be able to use a, as part of the cloud offering. We might see stuff that there is some like a mixed offering that you can control to a certain degree like Google is doing with Kubernetes. Might be using containers, might not. I have no idea. Might be Kubernetes, might not. Another interesting aspect of serverless is cold start. Do you know what, what is the cold start problem? Who knows what is the cold start problem? One, two, three. So let's, let's explain what is a cold start problem. That's a cold start problem. Have you ever seen that in your browser? Basically, you're waiting for your server to come up and respond. Give some response to the HTTP request that the browser just sent. You know, this HTTP response has to go to the network, go all the way to the data center. It takes about, you know, 200 milliseconds round trip, and then it needs to wait until a server is actually going to answer it. And I'm going to give you a prediction first. A new technology will emerge. I have no idea what's going to be that technology, which allowed to take cold start to less than 100, 100 milliseconds. It might be to start a VM, a container, a unikernel, a sandbox, or something different. And let's just ask a question. If your application starts in 10 milliseconds, Let's assume you can start your application in 10 milliseconds, just for a second. Do you need two instances to be running, one live, one backup? No. Because if one fails, by the time next request arrives, you'll have another instance running. No one will feel 10 milliseconds latency, or at least in most cases. Do you need the application to be running 24-7? No because by the time a request arrives, just bring it up and answer. You can then just kill the process. Do you need your database to be running 24-7 if it can start in 10 milliseconds? Again, you don't. So one check that I've done 
if I have asked, them, asked the following question. Let's assume that the request on the server takes milli 10 milliseconds, which is roughly a good mark, good ballpark number for both Java and Node.js. And let's assume that a server can handle 20 concurrent requests, just 20. It's not a lot, 20 concurrent requests. And let's talk about traffic of 1,000 RPM, 1,000 requests per minute. With those numbers, your server is going to be 0.1% utilized and idle, not doing anything 84% of the time. Basically, it's going just sitting there and waiting for traffic most of the time. And that's with uh, 1,000 RPM. So how much is 1,000 RPM? It takes 150,000 people, users, daily users, each doing 10 requests to generate 1,000 RPM. Guess what? We have in Wix over 100 million users. I think it's 130 million users right now. We have, when I checked that number, it was 25,000, 25, 2,500 running processes. Only 10% of them have 1,000 RPM. So, and that, that is not unique to Wix. That is in most data centers. Most servers in the world, more than 90% of them are doing nothing right now. They're not handling even a single request. You know, most of them. And talking about, I would guess that the waste factor is in the order of about 99.99 .99 of servers multiplied by time are idle. Kind of. So the magic pitch of a lot of, uh, of serverless is that you only pay for what you, what you use, right? You heard that. You only pay for what you use. Funny thing, 10 years ago, VMs, you only pay for what you use. That failed, right? right? App Engine, eight years ago, you only pay for what you use, right? Failed again. Those were actually the, were the things they were saying at the time. So what went, what went wrong? Cold start. That's a problem. And this problem, cold start, this is actually what it actually means in, in technical terms. It means that your first request arrives to a scheduler, some kind of reverse proxy that understands, oh, I have a request. I now need to start an instance of an application because none is running. Let's do some processing. It will take some time, 10, 20 milliseconds, whatever. And then let's start a process. If it's VM, it's two minutes. Will your user wait for two minutes in re to, for a request? No. If it's a container, it's two seconds. Are you, and are you okay with having new users arriving to your website wait for two seconds to get a response? Probably not. But it's only the first request, right? Because afterwards, the process is alive. But still, it's not, not good enough. And then, only then, your application actually starts. So then your process, you know, this is just the time to start the container, two seconds. The process itself might take 100 milliseconds, 1,000 milliseconds. You know, Node.js, normal Node.js application takes half a second to load. If you're talking about Java, it might take longer. And then, only then you start to handle the request. And that's 10 milliseconds. So the good news is that your request is actually the easiest thing there in this process. So cold start time takes, can take from over half a second to over two seconds, which is way too long. Which means basically that the functions, as we have them today, which are based on containers, takes two seconds to start in cold start. They're great for offline events. They're okay for REST APIs because you can sometimes get this two second latency. They're fine for high traffic sites because in most time the instance will be alive, high and alive and they're just useless for the long tail websites. What's a long tail website? 99.9% .9 of the websites in the world. There are about 100, over 100 million websites in the world. Most of them have so few traffic, valuable traffic, you know, traffic that can convert into paying customers, but still not enough traffic to keep an instance alive 24 seven or to pay for a for instance alive 24 seven, which means functions as we have them today are useless for that. Just as useless as a lot of other stuff. And just to get to understanding what it means when saying useless, the most strict API uh, is time to first byte. And we need to get that under 100 milliseconds for websites. The 200 to 500 milliseconds, that's okay. 
Over two seconds is considered slow and harmful for a website. So Google would actually penalize you if you it's your over two seconds. That means that VMs and containers and functions are as useless for low traffic websites as far, you know, just the same. All of them are just useless for that area. So we need a solution to start the process in 100 milliseconds. What we're doing today is actually something that sounds very simple. It takes some time to set it up right. We're starting the process way, way, way before a request arrives. But that process is not for a specific user. It's a generic process that does not have a code for a specific user. And then when a request arrives, we inject the user code into the process. Basically, we only give it the personality when we assign it to a website. So we have a pool of processes running that are not assigned to any website at a given time. And when a request arrives for a website that is a long tail website, we just inject its code into the process, let it handle the request, keep it alive for a few minutes, and then we just kill it. Let's continue on. And for another small prediction, tailored serverless. So tailored basically means serverless to solve a specific problem. And we are going to see stuff like that. I already talked about Twilio, which is doing serverless to handle phone calls and SMS. Cloudflare are doing actually something very unique. They are a CDN company. And they are allowing you to write serverless functions that are going to run in their edge proxies and allow you to customize how they're doing caching of your resources. Doing something very, very unique, they actually wrote their own a V8 wrapper to run JavaScript in term inside of their, I think it's, I don't, actually I'm actually not sure if it's Nginx or uh, something different, or Squids, or I don't know, but very, very interesting product, very, diff very unique approach to solve a problem. And of course, Wix Coach is a platform for front end. But we're going to see more stuff. We're going to see serverless to, to stuff like data processing, edge logic, real-time video processing, Maybe even AI, your ability to create your code that runs as part of an AI algorithm that is hosted somewhere. And we're go another thing is that we're going to see is serverless actually replacing configuration. I don't know if you know that, but JavaScript is the mostly used configuration language in the world. It's not a programming language. You configure a process called V8. Java is actually the next one, because Java actually j the JVM bytecode configures the JRE, configures the, the JVM. It's just a configuration language. We could have written that in Excel, in, sorry, in, in JSON or in XML. For some strange reason, we are considering XML as a configuration language and JavaScript as a programming language. But it's just something in our minds. And what we are going to see is the ability to take, instead of having so, such, those are actually screens from Gmail, for Gmail rules, so what if instead of looking at those screens and trying to say, if this email comes from this email address, then I want to apply this label, let's just try the code to do that. And just let it run as part of Gmail when I receive an email. Why not? It will have much more power much more options. So it's, again, something that we will be seeing. And so we're you know, talking about, the, about Wix code, about what we're doing. And let's ask the question, so why do you even need the serverless for the front end? So what, what's, what's the point? Because, you know, everyone is doing front ends, right? So what, is, what does it mean? What is a web app and a website? What's the difference? What's the problem? And I'm going to give you a very strange answer. The difference between web app and website is SEO. You know, SEO, search engine optimization, it's the ability of a bot to read your website and understand what there and make you found on Google or to be able to share your site on Facebook and see relevant information 
or on any other social network or any other search engine. And I'm going to give you an example here. So here we have a gallery. And this is actually a very nice gallery with certain plugin. And I can see that I can, I can share it. I can open up an image. And then I can take this image and I can share it in Facebook. So do a share, Facebook. Uh, I think it's not the same image, right? Something's wrong here. What's going on? I've shared this picture. Why is it saying this one? And it says something different, other texts. So what's going on here is that this gallery is using client-side state. It has a URL which has this part here after the hash which says which image to show. And so if I'm going to do, I'm going to open this image and I'm going to do a refresh of the page, I'm going to see the same image. But the bot doesn't see that. So now I can actually add a very nice gallery to my site that is meaningless to social networks and to uh, Google. And I can even share the picture. I have a share button here. How cool can it be? I'm sharing something and getting something different. Now, let's see, we've seen how we, how we see that, but let's see what SEO, some kind of an SEO wizard is about it. He actually sees something very different because it reads the HTML. It tries to read what is in there. It doesn't run the old JavaScript. And it sees something very different from what our view is. And this is actually going to be the snippet that we see in Google, which has nothing to do with the image we've seen. So all of this stuff is a pain. We can also go to stuff like, a, there's tools like a, why is it? There are tools like a Google Search Console, which give you a lot of information, so how your bot sees your website. But in any case, it is a problem. It is a challenge. And so a website is there to be found. The only reason to create a website, not a web app, a website is for it to be found, which means it has to be found by search engines or social networks. Both of them use the same tools, same bots, same SEO. Both of them are doing the same indexing. In order to do that, you need server-side rendering. One of the reasons why people use PHP to build websites is that in PHP, you do server-side rendering. In JavaScript, React, Angular, and especially things like jQuery and Bootstrap and so on, they don't do server-side rendering. Actually, today they do. React started doing that about a year ago, and Angular, a little bit. But it's very new, and the community is still somewhere in with that. Have you tried to do a setup of a server-side rendering website in React? I did. It, it is getting better and better. I did a setup of uh, React server-side rendering site. That was very tough. So, and this is very challenging. And let's look at it for a second. Traditional model of website basically means you do server-side rendering in PHP or Java or whatever, and then another developer is doing the client-side JavaScript, and they need to agree somehow. Not very nice. It's very double development, it's very challenging. The emerging model is to use server-side rendering, and that takes between 200 to 600 milliseconds easily, depending on how large, what you're doing, and it's very challenging also to configure and set up, which means there is an opportunity here. Because what if you could give you that as a service? What if you could do something like, you know, give us your freedom and we'll give you a solution? And the solution basically that we're doing at Wix today is that we are doing server-side rendering based on React, by the way. It takes us about half a second to do the rendering, but what actually happens is that we get a request, we decide which page we're going to show in about 10 milliseconds, send the headers to the browser, so the browser will start loading scripts already. We're keeping the HTTP response open. We're not closing the HTTP response at that time. Bots are happy because you got a response in 10 milliseconds, plus late network latency. Time to first byte is great. 
Then we're doing the server-side rendering in parallel to the browser downloading the scripts. And once we finish the server-side rendering, we're sending that as a chunk response. And this kind of unique, it's actually, let's say it's not unique for us, but it is a complex setup of your handling your HP response, make it, make, can get us to have the best performance with server-side rendering. Still getting all of the data on the HTML page. And this setup basically means that we're not doing a, like in a express, we're giving a response okay with the body, we're actually using a stream and streaming different stuff at different stages. This is actually the way Wix works today, server-side rendering, both mobile and both and desktop, and we are still improving that all the time. It's, there's so many details involved in making something like that work, very, work in the right way. So, it actually means that we should start rethinking about the web server. Instead of thinking about a server function that gets an HTTP request and returns an HTTP response, it might need to be split into a router function that just decides which page to show and then sends the add down to the browser with the SEO details that you need to put in the add. And then another part, which is an isomorphic rendering function, can run both on the client and the server with the write data, the hydration, and so on. I haven't seen yet a web framework that has that as a first class citizen. You still, always, you still need to, do, to build that yourself. React is getting close there to there, but it's still not there. And it's not, does, it's not a server side, it's not a server side a, a web a platform by itself. It's just a rendering engine, very cool one. So serverless for the front end, in order to do that, what you would gain is cold start, server-side rendering, the HTTP streaming, and probably a lot of other goodies, but what you're going to lose is a lot. You're going to, the price is very high. You're going to lose your choice of a front-end framework. You're going to lose your choice of a server framework. You're going to lose your choice of a, a, probably a lot of the build processes because it is very involved doing something like that. So this is basically what I'm, when I say serverless for the front, and this is the deal that I'm talking about. And this is, you know, we're doing it to some degree in Wix code. It's not something that only we can do. There's going to be other, prod, other products that's going to do stuff like that, because it's so obvious that we're moving in that direction. And it's going to be very interesting to see where we'll find the right balance, because then there is a balance here between what we're paying to what we gain. So, the takeaways I can give from this long talk. Serverless basically means a few things. It means that we have, we're going to have tailored serverless which is going to disrupt configuration and disrupt uh, front-end development. We're going to have cold start which can disrupt cloud can disrupt, disrupt the cloud economy. If for 90% of your servers you don't need to pay $300 a month anymore, that's a big hit for cloud providers. We're going to see a serverless orchestration which is going to disrupt containers. And all of these things are things that we, haven't, we don't know yet. And the reason why we don't see this uh, disruption for clouds yet is because no one has yet solved cold start for the gen generic case. That technology just doesn't exist yet. The reason why we don't see disruption for containers is because the serverless orchestration doesn't exist yet. It's just an idea. The reason why you're not working in the way I just suggested with front end, there's no such framework yet. Well, there is Wix code which are, we're doing that to some degree, but again, we're doing that for something very specific. Working with Wix, you gain the Wix, the drag and drop design, you gain back-end, front-end stuff, but you can't write, you can't use React. You don't code React, you use our tools. Okay, so next up we have Shai, which is gonna talk about a different aspect of building a technical product. 
And as I see him working slowly, 